Can you hear me? Okay. I guess we can get started. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Wojtek Mach, and I want to speak to you about building an umbrella project. Um, I work at Club Collect, and at my day job, I'm uh, mostly working with Ruby on Rails. And on a side, I'm basically trolling the Elixir community with toy projects like the GitHub API adapter for Ecto or the OOP library for Elixir. And today, I'd like to show another uh, toy project of mine. Uh, it's a bank, uh, Acme Bank. Okay, so what's an umbrella project? Before answering this question, I'd like to take a few minutes to uh, talk about some inspirations for this talk, uh, some resources that I have found uh, really insightful and uh, interesting over the years. The first one is a talk by Robert C. Martin at Ruby, um, at Midwest RubyConf 2011. Uh, the talk is titled as Architecture the Lost Years. In that talk, Robert um, described a typical Rails application to be just that, a Rails app. We look at the, um, at the project stu structure, we see the app folder and the controllers and models and views, but by looking at just the project structure, it's, a bit, it's often a little bit hard to see what the project actually does, what are the important parts, what's important and what's not, and how the things relate to each other. One memorable moment for me, for me from Robert's talk was when he said something along the lines that a top-level architecture should scream its intent. You, you should be able to look at it and understand what's going on. Another uh, resource is a talk by uh, Stefan Hagemann titled Wrangling Large, Large Rails Code Bases at uh, Rocky Mountain Ruby 2012. Um, Stefan uh, talked about large apps, and he gave a fantastic piece of advice uh, about writing them. Never write large apps. Um, Stefan showed how to structure a, a potentially big race project uh, to be a collection of components, gems and engines. A gem is like a hex package, and an engine is like a mini race application that's distributed, that's often distributed as a gem. What I think was really innovative in uh, Stefan's approach was that he used, used these engines and gems not as means of distribution of the code, but as a means to uh, break up your application into smaller parts, each with its own namespace and its own test suite and configuration and so on. And then the main Rails application didn't actually contain any logic of its own. It just held these engines and gems. Um, finally, uh, I'd like to talk uh, I'd like to mention one other talk, which is um, The Art of Destroying Software by Greg Young. The premise of that talk is pretty simple. Organize your project in a way that makes it easy to delete code. Perhaps there is a part of, uh, of your system that is a constant source of bugs, or it's really hard to understand, or usually both. When you need to make a change in that part, um, instead of patching it up, what if you could just throw it away and start from scratch? Um, start fresh, how liberating that would be. Um, but but you, you need to organize your project uh, to, to make it possible uh, first. And uh, I think it's a really powerful idea to organize a project in, in that way to make it easy to delete code. Okay, so what's an umbrella project? An umbrella project is basically a mix file. Uh, okay, hey, one second. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so <laughs> an umbrella project is, a, is essentially a mix file, an apps directory, and in that apps directory we have the collection of the OTP applications. For the, pur for the purpose of this talk, let's, talk, let's briefly talk about what an uh, OTP app is. Uh, per the uh, documentation, an application is a component implementing some specific functionality that can be started and stopped as a unit and, it, and which can be reused in other systems. An OTP application has, uh, can have application dependencies, so these are the applications that must be um, started before this application starts. Uh, there is a way to configure it and we can define the start and stop behavior. Um, in the start, when we start some applications, what we want to often do is to start a supervision tree, and depending if we have these supervisors, we sometimes can uh, um, 
can call an application to be a regular, regular application, or if it doesn't have super, supervisors, uh, it's sometimes called a library application. A good uh, example of a library application is Poison, uh, the, uh, the JSON uh, library for Elixir. Finally, um, OTP application is kind of a standard. Uh, if you know how to configure uh, an OTP application uh, and like start and stop it, if you can, um, if you learn how to configure one, you can pretty much configure any of them because they are all similar. It's a, like a shared understanding of how we should work with them. The word application itself, I think, is pretty interesting here because outside of the Erlang and OTP sort of ecosystem, the word application has usually a little bit of a different meaning. And um, when I think about OTP applications and the fact that it can be, again, configured, start and stopped, a word that comes into my mind is a server or a service. And um, so when we have a big service, when we have a big application, a lot of code, um, we could call it a big service, but if we have a very small and focused one, we could have a microservice, right? We'll talk about microservices at the end of this talk. Okay, so let's, um, let's build, uh, let, let me uh, walk you through building an umbrella project. So let's build the Acme Bank. Uh, so we create a new project. Uh, we're gonna call it Bank Platform and we pass the dash dash umbrella flag. It's gonna create a little bit different uh, mix uh, project. In the mix file, we can see that uh, we don't actually have the name of the application because the umbrella project itself is not actually an OTP application. It's just a container for, uh, for your other applications that are in the apps folder. So let's create our first OTP application and uh, we actually have a pretty interesting decision to make where to actually start. We want to have a web user interface for our bank but it doesn't mean that we absolutely have to start with the uh, web functionality first. I believe in uh, working on the uh, harder, uh, hardest problems first. And so I'd like to start with building the core business logic of our application first and then keep it decoupled from the web stuff and then later on we would uh, connect it. So let's build the uh, actual bank application that's gonna hold our logic. We uh, CD into the apps folder and we uh, run and, and we create a new mix project. We pass the sub flag because uh, we will want to have supervisors because uh, this bank application is actually going to maintain the uh, storage uh, as well. And, uh, and yeah, if, if we uh, create a new project within the umbrella, uh, Mix will know that it's in fact inside the umbrella and it's going to um, uh, change the Mix file a little bit. As you can see here, uh, like a difference from a regular Mix file is that we have the build path, config path, depth path, and the log file. And in fact, all of the, um, uh, all of the applications inside an umbrella will point uh, to these uh, directories and files that are in the root of the umbrella. They share the same dependencies and log file and build folder and all of that. Okay, so let's, um, let's build the first feature of our bank. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, compute the account balance uh, of an account. A naive approach to that would be to have an account struct with a balance integer, integer field. When we deposit some money into the bank, we would just increase the balance. However, this is not actually uh, at all how banks work. And uh, since this is uh, really important uh, to build a bank, uh, let me do a quick accounting one-on-one. -on -one. Any movement of money happens between at least two accounts. One account is debited and the other account is credited. For example, Alice transfers $100 to Bob. We would actually write two different entries for that movement of money. A debit to Alice for 100 and a credit to Bob for 100. If Bob transfers $20 back to Alice, we will have another debit for Bob and credit to, uh, to Alice and then maybe he sends 10 more so we will have the appropriate entries. Now, to calculate the balance, all we have to do is to get all of the entries for Bob and sum them. A credit uh, is gonna increase the account balance and the debit is gonna decrease it. So for Bob, oh, sorry, so for Bob we have 100 minus 20 minus 10, so it's 70. And for Alice we have the opposite. 
I think I have my math wrong. Sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, so yeah, so we have, for us, we have the opposite. And um, this is actually a pretty important rule in accounting that the sum of all credits must equal to the sum of all debits at all times. And uh, what we've briefly described is uh, called double entry accounting system. And uh, double entry because we write an, uh, every transaction twice, one for each um, account. So you might be uh, wondering like why I'm mentioning this. Um, as I mentioned, it's kind of like the core um, domain knowledge of the bank, so it's kind of important, but also it's functional. The list of um, entries uh, is immutable. We never go back and change an entry or, or delete it. We just keep going, keep adding these entries. And uh, actually, it has some interesting math mathematical properties as well. The order of the entries uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so it's both uh, associative and commutative. Like we, it doesn't matter if it's a debit and credit or a credit and debit. And uh, with, with some extra work, we could make it item potent. When we see an entry, uh, uh, we just make sure that one entry is only calculated once for the balance. And uh, with associativity, commutativity, and idempotence, this starts to look like a CRDT. And as you know, CRDTs are the foundation for the Phoenix presence. And there's actually a um, pretty interesting article on high scalability website that um, basically says that uh, banking systems are not strictly uh, consistent, but are actually eventually consistent. And this idea of eventual consist consistency for banks actually uh, is traced back to Renaissance era. And in a way, um, Florentine merchants like 600 years ago were using CRDTs be before it was cool. So I, I think that's pretty interesting. And um, finally, uh, like the whole reason to talk about accounting, I think it, this stuff is actually not non-trivial. And uh, I think in most, if not all, non-trivial applications, there's always going to be this essential complexity that's specific to your domain. And I think it's very beneficial to separate it out uh, so you can actually think about it in isolation. Um, independent of some details uh, like, like web. So uh, briefly, uh, I'm gonna talk about entities in our bank. So we are gonna have the account and entry that we just talked about, and then the customer. I want to keep a customer separate from an account because usually a customer can have more than one account, although uh, actually there's just gonna be one uh, for one uh, in this project. Um, so, uh, in a Phoenix project, we would implement these entities as models, uh, so web models, account, uh, and so on. However, sin since yesterday, as you know, models are out of fashion, uh, and moreover, it's not actually an, a Phoenix project, uh, so uh, we are gonna put this in lib, so it's gonna be lib, bank account, and so on. Um, so account and entry are a little bit different than a customer, because they uh, have a different rate of change. When we implement our uh, double entry accounting system, like after we implement it, we, are, we should be pretty much done with that code because the accounting rules are very stable, like 600 years old. Um, and it's like, and so that part is very much different from the customer because a customer is something very specific to our application. The customer can change as our requirements change in our particular bank, and uh, and so I think I think it's uh, it, it's very worthwhile to uh, to keep that separate, and in fact I'm gonna add it to a ledger, a sort of namespace and directory to to, to sort of show that it, it's separate. Um, so let's uh, talk about persistence. How we actually want to persist uh, this data? For simplicity, I'm just gonna use Ecto. And uh, now the question is, where do we put the repo access? Um, so also, since yesterday, you know that putting the repo access in controllers is uh, out of fashion as well. And uh, again, we don't really have a, it, it's not a Phoenix project, so where do we put it? Since uh, the bank ledger account and the ledger entry are in the ledger namespace, it's, uh, it's very natural to just put the extra functionality in the ledger module itself. So we are gonna have a function to calculate the balance and a function to write down these entries and persist them. 
And we are going to do the same thing for the bank. So there's going to be a create function, create customer function to, to actually create it, and then update customer, and so on and so forth. So, um, so we have these three functions, and they are use cases of our application. These are the high-level operations uh, of, that describe what the application does. And inside these, we have the repo access, or maybe calling out to different services. But on the outside, this is, this is what our, our, our application is doing. And our uh, a benef additional benefit of, of that is that we can just call these functions in our controllers or tests or IEX or seeds. We don't, go to, we don't need to go through the repository. We can just call these very short named functions with very descriptive names and, uh, get, um, and get the job done. So we talked uh, a little bit about uh, accounts and uh, balances. And so brief, let's talk briefly about how do we actually want to store that. So uh, in many banks, we have to support multiple currencies. So let's have, um, so we're gonna keep both the amount and currency on the money, on the money uh, record. We also will have some operations like adding two different money objects and we usually want to make sure that we add stuff in the same currency because like, you can have unexpected, unexpected um, results otherwise. And also uh, persistence. Since we store both amount and currency, uh, we, want, we, we are gonna need to uh, serialize that to a database column to, to keep it in, uh, in SQL. And, um, and so, so uh, actually all of, these, uh, all of these things that we need to do are um, actually pretty generic and it, they could be reused somewhere else. So we don't want to, in my opinion, so I don't want to put that in the bank application and I want to uh, actually keep it separate so then later on maybe if I'm gonna open source it, it's gonna be absolutely trivial to just publish it to Hex. And by starting, uh, from the get-go with a separate application for money, which is gonna be a regular application with no supervisors. When I start uh, with an OTP application from the get-go, I, I achieve, um, I'm more productive by doing that because if the code is already at hand in the umbrella project, I don't have to worry about versioning or releases or like coordinating pull requests between two different Git projects. So it's, um, it's much more productive and it's uh, actually a case for all of the applications in your umbrella. It's just so much easier to have everything uh, in one repository, although nicely partitioned and uh, have everything at your finger fingertips. Um, in order to use uh, the money application in the bank application, we need to set it as a dependency. There's an extra in umbrella flag that you can uh, use and then so Mix is gonna know that it needs to find this package in the umbrella and not on hex PM. We also need to add it to the applications list. Even though it doesn't start uh, supervisors, it needs to be there. Okay, so let's talk about the, the web interface for our bank. This is how we are gonna create it. We just, again, CD to the uh, apps directory and we uh, create a new um, Phoenix project. Uh, mix will know that we are inside the uh, umbrella, so it's gonna uh, create the correct mix file. And then we, we, we will again have to add a, a bank this time as a dependency uh, to our bank web, uh, web app. And this is kind of important. Um, our web interface depends on the business logic, but not the other way around. The business logic doesn't care about web. It doesn't reference it in any way. Okay, so bank web. Um, this is actually pretty boring because since we already have the business logic, all we need to do is to just, um, just use it from the controllers and views, so just, just calling these functions. So I'm not gonna show that. But I want to really mention, uh, again, the separation of concerns that we've achieved by, uh, by doing it. We can evolve the web application separate from the domain logic and the other way around. It's also kind of um, important when you have to make major changes. So um, I'm not sure if anyone was ever on a big uh, web UI uh, kind of redesign project. Anyone? 
Um, so I've been a on, on a project like that a couple of times, and uh, I really wished that I would just start from scratch, right? Because the UI was so coupled to, to everything else. But if we now keep it separate, we can, again, as Greg Young uh, um, said, we can just delete the web stuff and just start from scratch. Or at least we have a very nice uh, sort of, we, we have good places to find the, the functionality. Um, okay, so, um, so this was, so this, was the, the, this is the application for the web UI and uh, for the customers to use. And then in our bank, uh, in production, we, uh, we want to have some functionality for the operators like customer service and, and stuff like that. So let's add a, kind of like an admin interface for our bank. Um, I'm gonna call it back office just because that's how it's usually called in the bank uh, industry. All we need to do is to just, all we need to have uh, here is just some screens to like see all of the accounts and transactions and stuff. And uh, I, could, I could write it, but there is actually an excellent X admin uh, package on Hex. And uh, it actually works out of the box with umbrellas. And in fact, I shouldn't even mention it because there is nothing special about X admin because um, because it, it's just o, it's just OTP applications. They, they they just work by design because we, we are using again that shared understanding. Um, okay, so with the back office, which is another Phoenix app in our project, we need to set up different ports in development. So maybe there is port 4000 for our main Phoenix app and uh, port 4001 for the uh, for the back office. Um, so this uh, sort of mention of different ports uh, is a sort of sign that our deployment is gonna be, is gonna be a little bit more complicated. And uh, I'm gonna talk about deployment in a second, but I also want to mention uh, uh, the talk, Phoenix is not your application by Lance um, earlier this year. I think this is like having the back office and bank web in one umbrella project, uh, umbrella project is a testament to this idea that there isn't anything special about Phoenix. It's not in fact your application because you can have many instances of Phoenix in your project. There, there isn't anything special about Phoenix. It just, it's just an OTP app. Okay, so um, briefly talking about deployment. I'm deploying it to Heroku just because it's, uh, it's easy. And um, in Heroku, you can only have one, uh, only, uh, like only one process can bind to a web port. Uh, but, but we have two applications, so, so what I did is I have a, a, a very simple uh, proxy uh, application that just forwards the requests to the appropriate uh, Phoenix endpoint, uh, depending on the URL. And a uh, big thanks to uh, Gary Rini, uh, who allowed me to use uh, that code. It, it, it's really simple, it's just a few lines, really. Um, and uh, speaking about deployment, uh, distillery, uh, which is an XRM replacement. Uh, it already has a first-class support for umbrellas. So, uh, so if you want to do OTP releases with umbrellas, that should be very easy with distillery. Um, okay, so now I want to briefly mention an aut authentication subsystem of our bank. So authentication is one of these things that uh, all, like, pretty much always starts very small and often stay small, but there are certain cases where in, in certain apps, authentication can, can get really complicated. So I decided to, um, to start with a separated authentication subsystem uh, first. So you might be wondering, well, maybe it's a bit of an upfront design. And I get that, but I think there is uh, actually merit to it. If you are building a bank, we, we are gonna know that we will have um, uh, certain features that we're gonna uh, absolutely need. Like maybe there are different strategies, like the customers are gonna sign in with the username and password, but the operators uh, might need something like LDA AP. Um, we probably are gonna need two-factor authentication. Uh, we probably gonna need some tracking, like IP tracking, to get that annoying message that you're logged in to your bank from a different country and it's not gonna allow you and stuff. Um, so, so we, we have uh, all of this extra functionality that we need, uh, that, that we're gonna need, so that's why uh, uh, I, I wanted to uh, create a separate authentication. And in fact, uh, the authentication subsystem is gonna maintain the user accounts. 
And for that, uh, there's a separate Ecto repo and actually a separate database because I think that, um, in my opinion, each application should maintain its own state. Uh, so that's why there's a separate repository, of, uh, Ecto repository from the, from the other um, bank. And uh, thanks to Chris McCord for um, some inspiration for extracting out the authentication into a separate app. I also have a messaging uh, subsystem in the bank, but I, I won't get to in, into that today. And, um, and yeah, this is our bank platform. We have seven applications, uh, Auth, Bank, Bank Web, Back Office, Master Proxy, Messenger, and Money. And each application is an OTP application with very well-defined uh, dependencies. And because of that, we can actually uh, graph how our platform looks like what depends on, uh, on what. So it's kind of like this top level architecture that we want to have when we come into a new project. We can see um, what, what are the pieces. And as we, um, as we evolve our project, uh, we, we are gonna have even more applications. So in a bank, maybe we are gonna have some fraud detection subsystem that monitors the incoming transactions. Or maybe there's gonna be a landing page uh, that um, that's going to be like a marketing landing page. Maybe it's going to uh, become a CMS system of some sorts later on. So, uh, so yeah, we can see uh, like we can manage the growth of our system by keeping uh, the applications separate. Okay, so I want to try a quick demo of how it is to actually work with uh, Umbrella project. So let me, um, let me make that bigger. Okay, is that uh, readable enough in the back? In the back? Bigger? Okay. okay. Uh, so yeah, so we are in the root of our project. We can inspect the apps folder. Uh, we can see our, all of our apps. Um, we can uh, run the tests. Uh, so if we are in a mix project, uh, uh, mix will automatically run tests for each application in your umbrella, which is really useful. When we uh, CD into a protocol app, we can run the test suite separately. So it's really good, right? We can work on our application separately, run the tests, iterate, and then after we are done, we can go back and run all of the tests to make sure we didn't break anything. Okay, so... Um, because we have all of the code uh, in one uh, uh, directory in one Git project, um, we can actually navigate uh, the project very easily. Uh, so we can, uh, let's see. So we can go to Ledger, we can go to Money, uh, which is a different uh, OTP project. We can quickly jump around the project without going to a different uh, repository, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, very fast to actually uh, work on the project. Um, okay, so I have a console uh, that I started for this project, and uh, because we have these uh, modules that describe our uh, use cases, we can actually uh, sort of look at them. So we have the bank, and then we, we can see there is a create customer function or create deposit, find customers, so we can actually look at that. Um, like, uh, and again, uh, like uh, calculating balance, instead of calculating that in the controller, we actually have a place to put all of that logic and we can document it. Um, uh, so yeah, oops, I should start that. Uh, so let me uh, quickly show you how uh, the application looks like. So this is the, um, this is a very simple uh, user interface for the bank uh, that's running on port uh, 4000, and we have the back office application of 4001. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, uh, all of the code is, uh, is available on GitHub. It's easy to deploy to Heroku, um, and you can see all of the applications. So, 
So let's go back to the talk. Okay, so as we mentioned, uh, uh, an OTP application is a little bit like a microservice. So there are well-known benefits and drawbacks of microservices, like there, there are strong module boundaries and independent deployments, and, and the drawbacks are uh, operation complexity. Um, so I was planning to do a comparison of microservices and umbrellas, but if I told you that umbrellas give you pretty much all of the benefits with none of the drawbacks, you won't uh, believe me anyway. So I will just leave it like that uh, as an exercise to, to the viewer. So with, uh, with umbrellas <laughs> and microservices, it's a little bit like with microservices, right? They, they won't solve your problems. You still need to architect your system. You want to have just the right amount of applications and with the right responsibilities. You don't want to have too much or, or too many. And to conclude, uh, keep an eye on the big picture and uh, don't write a large app. Keep, keep it separated. Isolated by functionality and by the rates of change of these uh, components and uh, delete code liberally. And uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? In the front. So I'm kind of a big fan of microservices, but I, I certainly understand those drawbacks. Nonetheless, the big benefits to me are the independence, independence of technology, and independently being able to scale or release different services. A lot of that goes away if you stay entirely in the Erlang Elixir ecosystem, but most of the time you can't, especially with large organizations, you're gonna have multiple technologies. So how do you, ma how do you map into sure. that kind of a microservice environment? Yeah, so that's a, good, that's a great question. Um, I, I mean, if, you're in, if in your organization you just um, have components in other technologies, you, you just can't do anything about that. That's just a fact. But I think there is actually, a, I mean, it depends on the organization, but there is a big benefit to, to, uh, to stay on the same stack because then you can switch to different teams. Um, as far as scalability issues that you mentioned, uh, I think it's still uh, compatible with umbrella applications. Um, you have the flexibility of deploying just one application to a cluster of nodes and other application to a different cluster. So you, you have everything in one project, but you can just figure out how you want to deploy it. You, you have a lot of options. So uh, it, it's sort of like Google has this huge repository uh, right, with all of the code, but they still deploy it separately, so you, you actually have an option uh, for that. Not sure if that answers the question, but. You talked about uh, organizing your code in a way that makes it easier to delete. Are you, are you just saying that an umbrella makes it easier to delete, or is there more you can say about organizing your code so it's easier to delete it? Sure, I mean, um, like this principle of organizing your product, pro, uh, project to delete code is not sort of specific to Umbrella, like there isn't anything special about Umbrella. It's more of a general principle, but I do think that uh, having an Umbrella kind of uh, guides you into the, that direction, that you have these small pieces that are very um, isolated and independent of each other, and then you can sort of take them uh, and think about them separately, and then if you just want to start from scratch with a component, you can, you can do that. But yeah, if you structure your um, like big application uh, in, in a way that each piece is separate, then yeah, you can, you can delete that. But I just think that uh, here with a, an umbrella, you, it's a little bit easier uh, to, to go into that direction where pieces are uh, separate. Right there. I'm curious if you can speak a little bit toward whether there are any guidelines for how you would write integration tests for a system like this. Like it seems like you would probably have some type of top level integration test, but I would also like feel a pull toward the rabbit hole of having an integration test for like every you know, interaction between dependencies as well. So any guidelines there? Yeah, so th that's a very good question. Um, I, uh, 
I, I, well, you, you can approach it like you, you would normally approach that maybe the, you would have integration tests for, the, um, for the, the bank web UI, which is kind of like the entry point. You could have integration, integration tests uh, there. But I, I think uh, uh, an, uh, another interesting approach is to actually uh, even have, I, I mean, I explored with the idea a little bit, but an interesting approach is to actually have a separate uh, kind of project that integration integration tests the entire thing, and what's kind of cool about that is that you can even um, like deploy everything maybe to Heroku, like all of the applications, and then integration test that uh, kind of live, which uh, sort of compared to microservices, it's a little bit easier because with microservices you kind of have to deploy everything separately, and here you have everything in a bundle. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, mean I, I don't really have any specific guidelines uh, at this moment, but yeah, uh, I, I think there are good options. When you're using uh, master proxy, is there a way to share logins and authentication? Uh, could you repeat, sorry? Um, when you're using master proxy, uh -huh. uh, to, you, you have the separate uh, administrative application? Uh, is there a way uh, so, to share authentication and logins between those two applications? Oh yeah, definitely. So, uh, so yeah, there is the um, uh, the uh, the authentication subsystem uh, keeps uh, track of the um, of the login information. So, uh, you, you would uh, use the auth um, application in either of these apps, um, uh, and then the ma master proxy really does just the kind of like a router. It just forwards requests. So. Um, you, you solve the authentication uh, problem on the on each uh, separate web application. Anyone else? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.